Hi, and welcome to Rethink Dialogue. In today's episode, we're going to sit down with Thomas Marzano, who is the global head of design at Philips. Uh, let's go and have a compelling conversation with that guy. Hi, Thomas. Welcome to Rethink Dialogue. Uh, first question. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself, your background, professional, personal. Right, so my name is uh, Thomas Marzano and I'm a global head of brand design at, uh, at Philips. Mm -hmm. Work at uh, the global headquarters of, of Philips in, uh, in Amsterdam and I lead the, uh, the, the brand design team in, uh, in Amsterdam. And um, yeah, if you ask me a little bit about my, uh, my background, uh, actually I started my, uh, my career in, uh, in music. Mm. Already from uh, from a very young age, since I was uh, eleven, you know, I was captivated and fascinated by uh, by music, and uh, um, I went on to to study sound engineering and uh, music composition. Okay. And actually, I started out my career, and actually, that was also my entrance into the digital world, if you will, mm. uh, through uh, creating soundtracks and musical composition for multimedia productions which was my entry into the mu new media world. Yeah. And, uh, and because I was always a little bit of a geek and I like to play around with computers and I like to uh, build websites and figure things out, before I knew it, I was uh, uh, not only doing the music, but I was also designing either the CD-ROMs or the interactive parts, mm. and that soon became websites. And that's sort of how I entered the world of design, the world of new media, and, uh, yeah, and that's really where my, my career started. And, in a world today where the focus, especially also for me and, and, and in my current role, looking at brand design and brand experience design, oh. on hindsight, what I find so interesting about, uh, about the way I went through my development and my, my own search for what I do is that if there is one red thread, mm -hmm. it is creating experiences. Yeah. Because making music is about creating experiences for an audience yeah. and uh, where uh, let's say advertising or traditional communication is very much about, uh, you know, very explicit experiences and stories. Mm. Music is much more about subliminal experiences and stories, which are highly subjective. You know, you, you yeah. might relate to a song in a different way that I do, mm. and and so it's this emotional part of experiences that has always captivated me, yeah. and uh, and is very much part of I think of what uh, what I still do today. Cool. Good one. Um, so great brand experience is about leadership. You said that in your presentation. Correct. What do you mean about that? Well, what I, what I basically mean with that is that, uh, of course, you know, I don't want to downplay uh, design at all. I mean, I'm a designer and I know <laughs> how important design is to, to, to achieve a brand experience. But I see design as a, uh, a facilitator of the creation of a brand experience. But mm -hmm. in order to, to, to even do it, mm. you need a very clear and focused leadership that is fully supportive and a full believer that it's through a great brand experience mm. that you create brand loyalty and that that will then convert into loyal customers. Right. Um, and there is no way that a, a brand or a company can achieve that great experience from a product point of view mm. without that relentless focus uh, and belief from mm. the leadership. Because if that focus isn't there, then the leadership will focus on return on investment, they will you know, focus on the technology, they will focus on the bottom line sales. And that to me is the, the wrong way up. Mm. It starts with a great experience and the rest should follow. Yeah, cool. Um, so how do you think that design is an important part of marketing? So the marketing journey in general? Absolutely. I think uh, what I always say is that you know design. Well, first of all, if you if you think about advertising and and uh, and, and and marketing, traditional ac advertising is about shouting, mm. <laughs> and design is about whispering. And I think there is th there is a lot of truth in that, and that mm. is that it's the explicit versus the subliminal. Mm. And design can really help you connect emotionally with a, with an audience. And yeah. design doesn't need to be explicit. It doesn't need to be very clearly stating, uh, uh, you know, this is what we want you to think or feel or understand. Design can be subjective. Mm. And it is about really establishing an emotional connection with your audience. And whether that is the product itself, or whether it is your campaign, or whether it is your 
brand identity, if you will, you know, the, 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 graphic, uh, the graphic design. I think all of these instruments that design shapes mm. uh, are there to, to connect with, with your specific audience. Mm. So that is, I think, the relationship that the two have. It's the implicit versus the explicit mm. uh, relationship uh, the two have. Which brings us over to the cognitive dissonance. Yes. You mentioned that in your talk yesterday. And, and from a brand perspective, I mean, there's a lot of brands that have that issue. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess it's, uh, it, you know, first of all, from an experiential point of view, it's the worst thing that can happen to you, yeah. right? If, you, if, if what, you're, what you're saying is, is not aligned with what you're doing, you know, you do it once, you do it twice, you know, the third time around, your customers will, you know, no longer believe you and they will, you know, lose all of their trust and, mm. and they will move, move on to, mm. to a different brand. Um, the reason why we see it happening is, is basically because, well, first of all, it is really hard to align what you say to what you do, yeah. especially when your focus is on marketing instead of product. Mm. I am a full believer that it starts with product. Mm. It starts with creating the product. The product is your experience and your product is your advertising. Mm. And then you build your marketing around it mm -hmm. and not the other way around. It's not you start with your marketing and then, you know, oh, well, let's put this product with that marketing. <laughs> no. you know, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really about uh, making a great synergy between the two. And that means, especially within, uh, let's say, larger, larger organizations, mm. it means that across the silos of a company, across the function of, of, a, of a company, mm. you need to start to operate in a much more fluid way. Yeah. So less uh, waterfalling, so you know, here's the R&D team, they will come up with a technology, here's the design team, they will then design the product, here's the development team, they will make, it, make sure that it's ready for, uh, for uh, mass production, mm. then it goes to marketing and, and sales and they will make sure that it will, you know, uh, gets, gets distributed and, uh, and sold. Mm. If you think of that process as a cascading linear process, then you know, the disconnect might be huge. Mm. Whereas if you work across of these silos, across of these functions in an integrated way, mm. your, your whole process will end up being an integrated one. Yeah. And your message versus what your product actually does will be much more aligned. Mm. Now that's very simple to say, but yeah. to achieve that in a large organization is, of course, quite a challenge. You need to, you know, you need to overspan a lot of uh, uh, functions, a lot of you know, locations often. Mm. Um, and this is where I think the modern age of, of digital and social technologies can really help uh, to accelerate this kind of process. Mm. Uh, you know, it's really easy you know, with, uh, with internal social media and collaboration tools to quickly connect with, uh, with groups within an organization. Uh, you can have organic teams forming along the way. Mm. And from, from a leadership point of view is going, moving from let's say the command and control type of leadership style to a uh, inspire and enable style mm. you know where you know by through inspiring your teams with with the right vision on where to go but then enabling the company and the organization to really move in a more organic and agile way mm. uh, and collaborate with each other and search for networks within the organization to pull pull off projects in, uh, in, in new ways, yeah. uh, I think is crucial to, uh, to achieve this. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so what, what, I talk a lot about principles when it comes to rethink, because that means that people actually can develop their own methods uh, and, and use those principles to, in their own company. Yeah. So what kind of principles do you think would you share with us from the Philips brand point of view? Right. Uh, well, I think from a Philips brand point of view, but also I think from a from, from a design point of view, is uh, well, first and foremost, uh, the 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 focus and the uh, belief that if you put your customer mm. at the heart of your innovation, at the heart of your experience creation, at the heart of your design, mm. um, that is ultimately the only way for a sustainable business. Mm. And I think that, uh, that that is not only a philosophy that, uh, that, that is part of the Philips mission, but it's also very much a design philosophy. You know, user-centered design is something that has been around for quite a while, and yeah. I think at Philips we've been championing that for, for many years. Uh, and, uh, and it's very much a, a philosophy that I, that I uh, hold myself as well, is that you know, every time that you start with 
really connecting and understanding your audience and involving them in the, the process of design. And mm. you know, again, today, this is even easier than in the past. You know, with, uh, with all the technologies at our uh, disposal, we can involve, we can connect, we can collaborate and co-create mm. together with, uh, with our customers uh, together. Mm. Um, I think the other philosophy is, uh, so next to the user-centered design, uh, the other philosophy is, uh, full integration of the capability of design uh, in your business process and in your business strategy. Mm -hmm. So I am a, a, a fundamental believer uh, that design is not something you outsource. Design is something that needs to be integrated into your business. Preferably, mm. it needs to have a management role uh, in all the layers of the organization, preferably represented in your board of management as well. Mm. Uh, so it's not something which is reporting into marketing. It's not something which is reporting into R&D. It should be something that is its own function. Mm. Why? Because design is a translator and facilitator of ideas mm. uh, and especially if you uh, if you look at design uh, from uh, let me rewind design can be seen uh, uh, you can use the word design in two ways right mm. you can use it uh, to say and describe this is the design mm. so then it really becomes about the aesthetics about the execution and about all the skills involved to create that final product or artifact yeah but if you think of design as a process, so to design, mm. so it's the process of designing, uh, designers use a lot of tools and methodologies that can not only be used to come to a final artifact, but mm. they can also be used, and we call it design thinking you know, mm. in, uh, in, um, in the industry, can also be used to uh, formulate strategies, to get clarity on, uh, on, uh, on new business opportunities and new business territories. So leveraging the design function and what design can do, so basically being a catalyst of creativity and a catalyst of, of thought, mm. um, that is something that can be of great value and, and uh, of an organization to mm. help the, the company move out of the current frameworks of thinking mm. and find new ways and new territories. So that is, that is a couple of principles that, yeah. uh, that I fundamentally believe in. Good. Um, you also, um, so Philips has a very clear definition of the customer journey. You yes. had a, what yeah. do you call it? You call it a, there's another. The customer journey, yeah. yeah. The customer decision journey. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, t so how, 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 how did you come up to the different Point and how aware are you on each element of that journey? Right. So, <clears throat> well, first of all, what uh, what uh, what is important is that the uh, uh, the customer decision journey is, of course, uh, pivoting around each customer. Mm. If you look at the Philips brand and the Philips company, uh, we serve many, many different customers, both in B two B and B two C. So. There is no one customer decision journey in our case. There is mm. many. Mm. Uh, and so the customer decision journey as a methodology or as a tool mm. uh, is something that uh, we have developed along the years using best practices both from ourselves but also from industry standards. Uh, and uh, so the framework of really looking at the end-to-end the, the -end journey, so where uh, in, for example, in the B2C space, mm. uh, you start with a trigger. So what is the moment that a person is triggered to start to engage with a brand, mm. right? And this trigger could be an, uh, a, uh, an, an a piece of advertising, but mm. it could also be, hey, my product needs replacement. Mm. Or it could be a shift in life stage. You mm. know, if your wife is pregnant mm. and uh, you're about to get a kid, your trigger is, okay, there is all these... Uh, potential product and brands that I need to start to explore. I need a buggy, I need uh, you know, bottles to feed my child, I need a baby monitor. So that could also be a trigger. Mm. So there's many, many different triggers that can start to, to propel you into the journey of discovering products and discovering brands that you want to relate to. Mm. Now, once that trigger has happened, the journey of uh, exploring the, the, the brands, uh, uh, filtering down the brands and products that you know, could work for you down to final decision making of this is the product and this is the brand that I trust. Mm. Down to the moment of purchase, uh, first time use at home, and then the months, years that you're using a product. 
uh, and of course, you know, if, uh, if, if all goes well, uh, the support that you get, the extra services that we provide, and hopefully the returning customer. Mm. That is a framework that we apply to, mm. to all the journeys that we, that we identify. But then to inform those journeys, dependent on, on which category, which, com which customer we're in, we leverage all of the, the research data at our disposal. Mm. And in some cases, uh, this is uh, field work. In some cases, so for example, we did, uh, we did a customer journey for uh, radiologists, mm -hmm. where we really sent a team out to five different hospitals, uh, and they spent two days following the radiologist's daily activities mm. to really understand, well, how does, how does a day in a life of a radiologist look like? Mm and how do they interact with our products, how do they interact with our services, and what are opportunities to create a better brand experience and connect better. So the methodology framework is there, and it took us you know, a couple of years to really install it and, and make it become a best practice. Mm. And, uh, and we've really then looked at, okay, how can we now get this to the next level? And the next level for us is how much real-time data can we get into this customer journey? Mm. Before it was indeed, you know, leveraging on research reports and uh, you know things that we had uh, on, on on shelf and we could do. Mm. But now we have the luxury that we can listen to a lot of data, both coming from coming from our websites. Mm. Uh, we can uh, so we can track everything. Uh, we have data coming from our products. We have data coming from our brand analysis. What are people thinking and saying about our products online? Mm. Uh, so all of that data is starting to come in in real time. So we're 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 moving towards almost like a dashboard experience where these customer journeys, uh, we can real time see mm. where we need to spend the attention, where can we improve the experience, where is the experience broken, mm. right? where are people not, uh, not believing or not understanding our proposition. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's, 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 it's in constant development. Mm. But I think if if I can mention one thing that, that I think at Philips we, we do slightly different than the industry standard is that um, where in the industry a customer decision journey is really uh, touch point centric. So what are the touch points along the way that we use and customer come across and how can we put our message on there mm. and how are they performing? Mm. What we focus on is we focus on the customer experience. So we try and understand what are the customer needs at each specific point in time? What are their, let's say, emotional barriers and emotional needs at every moment? Yeah. And really formulate that into an experience. So what would be the experience mm. that would help them to the next level? What is the experience that, will, um, that they are looking for and that will create the, bre the brand relevance and the brand meaning? Mm. And once that experience is formulated and clear, that's when we go and look into touch points. What are then the touch points that we need to influence? What are the touch points that we need to design? Mm. So we put experience first. Right, cool. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so Philips has some clear values. You, you have caring, innovative, impactful. Yes. So how, how is the process of coming up to those? And are they, uh, is it like part of the backbone of the company? Like, are everyone aware of those three words? Yeah, so, well, it's an interesting question because, uh, of course, you know, before you get to three words that synthesize, you mm. know, what you want to be and are as a brand, of course, it takes, takes a long time, right? It's a, yeah. it's a long process. Uh, but fundamentally, I mean, the way that it came about is um, by refocusing the, the brand positioning mm. to, you know, Philips, the, delivering innovations that matter to you, mm. right, which is basically what, what the promise is of the brand. Mm -hmm. Um, it was really about looking again at who are we really and what is it that we really do. So we really try to, to, to reflect what the company is and company is about instead of trying to reflect something that 
is a nice marketing story, but you know the company is really not embodying. Mm -hmm. So we try to keep it very close, so that once we um, uh, once that we started to socialize the new brand within the company, mm. uh, that people would recognize it, so that employees immediately kind of recognize, well, indeed, that's what we do. Mm. So that was very very important in the whole process. Uh, so you can imagine that you know hundreds of words you know were explored because you can express you know many different things, but fundamentally what you see in the three words is a, quite a simple thought and that is caring really stands for our empathic uh, empathetic approach mm. uh, and and in, indeed the, 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 the true focus on understanding people and delivering value to them mm. and that we believe that the only way to do that is by fundamentally caring about the individual mm. and caring about the person. And if you look at what the company has been doing over the last few years, that's absolutely what, what we are about and, mm. and how we innovate. Mm. Then <clears throat> the other aspect is the impactfulness. And uh, the impactfulness is, is our focus on being the brand that cares for people and wants people to live a healthy life and be healthy. And, um, and therefore, whatever we do, needs to have an impact in someone's life mm. in that space. After being touched by the Philips brand, either through a consumer product or because you've been treated in a hospital, mm. we had an impact in your life. We mm. have improved a part of your health and well-being. Mm. And, and that is why we are innovative mm. because and that gives us the focus also for our innovation so mm. this is where and that you know being innovative and and being innovative both in in our business um, in our business processes in the way we work in the way we collaborate in the way we innovate from a technology and scientific point of view uh, from a business model point of view so innovate in the largest sense of the word mm. um, is something that we've been doing for 120 years so that if, if there is one thing that is really kind of at the heart of course of the company is that so is these three components so by being caring and focus on people mm. by inno innovating on top of that to really have an impact in people's lives mm. that is what the company is about mm. and so when we when we put that together and we tested it and we started to socialize it within the company it resonated so well people understood it so easily mm. um, that we knew that we were on the right track and we were yeah. doing the right thing uh, and I think when we launched the brand externally and uh, you know with the promise of innovation in you and uh, I think it's very concrete mm. you know innovation in you mm. well, that's a, th a simple thought, mm. and it's uh, it's it's resonating a lot in the market and uh, in the, in every uh, region. Uh, uh, people are responding really well to the to the brand, mm. and uh, and it's connecting. I think our audiences also with 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 the company and with the people inside the company. Mm. It's the, it's the simple thought that's connecting uh, connecting the two. Yeah. Cool. So uh, over to the personal questions. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, uh, <laughs> a chef. A chef. Yeah. Oh. I'm a I'm a real food buff, and uh, <laughs> and uh, wherever I go on uh, on uh, on in the world, you know, like for me, the favorite thing to be able to do, especially because I travel a lot for mm. work, and you know, usually what you see is airport, taxi, hotel, <laughs> event, or you know, company building, and then a restaurant. Yeah. So to me, like the focus always is like, okay, let's, what's the <laughs> restaurant going to be, and uh, and what's the food, and you know, because food is is something so essential to culture right yeah. and uh, it's it's so uh, it's so expressive of of, uh, of a culture and uh, um, you know all over the world we we share some traditions but also there is a lot of a lot of difference and you can really taste the essence of a culture in uh, in mm. uh, in how they cook so you know for me if there is if there is another life after design <laughs> then uh, then definitely it would be uh, it would be in the, in the restaurant and food business I see the connection to the experience here. <laughs> yeah, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that, that would be the red thread. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then the other question is, what profession would you not like to do? Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not because I don't like to do it. It's just because my brain just doesn't function that way. Mm. And that is that is really anything that has to do with uh, pure financial responsibilities. Mm. Uh, my brain just doesn't. Well, fundamentally, it doesn't get it as mm. uh, as um, 
because my mind is sort of hardwired to, to think people and experience first. And if I need to think money first, mm. then I lose the plot. And mm. I start to make decisions and priorities that to me feel fundamentally wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that brings me actually a little bit maybe to, to my own view of the status quo of today, where I think there is a, uh, you know, the financial world and the, 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 the brand world and the tension that is, that is there also in this financial crisis, mm. you know, is, there, is a, there is a tension between being profitable for, for shareholders and, and really delivering value to, to customers. Mm. And, you know, the two sometimes just are not in common interest. No. And, uh, and, uh, and so that, you know, I, I, can't, I can't really deal with that. And I'm very happy that there is people around me in the company that are very good at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, that would never be my career choice. No, I agree with you. Um, last question, one word, what inspires you? What inspires me? Mm. Um, well, without sounding too cliche, but unfortunately it's just the way it is. And that is that uh, any kind of surprising element in, in life can, 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 can inspire me. And, and usually it's in, within the details. Mm. Um, it's really the small things, you know, it's the small interactions between people. It's, uh, you know, small details that you see around you. You know, it can be a little piece of architecture or a design detailing or, you know, even if I, you know, just, I'm just looking outside the window and, you know, I'm fascinating, fascinated about the lock that I see on those, uh, on those doors. Mm. And they can, it's all these small little triggers that just set me off mm. and, 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 uh, and put me thinking. And at the same time, there's also kind of the more fundamental things in life that, uh, that, that trigger me. Uh, and it's the, I call it like the, 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 dra the drama of life sometimes, you know, mm. it's the, the, the drama both from a, from a, a fun point of view, but also from a, from a more sad point of view. Mm. Um, you know, the things that you read in the news or the things that happen within your family when, when people get sick or, you know, when, when, when people are well, good things, when people achieve something. Um, like looking at my son, you know, like uh, achieving small steps in life and overcoming, you know, certain, mm. certain barriers, uh, you know, as a child growing up. Uh, you know, those are the things that, uh, that, uh, that do inspire me and, and bring me to, to, to think and to reflect mm. on life and to bring me to reflect on how I do things. And, um, and that then can, can, you know, that comes out in whatever kind mm. of shape or form some, mm. you know, in, in some way. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that, that inspires me a lot is the things that are wrong and broken in the world. Mm. Inspire me, of course, in, in a different sense. So not inspire me to kind of, uh, you know, create beautiful things, but inspire me to, tr what can I do to solve a problem? Mm. What, what's wrong here? Why is this broken and how can we solve it? Mm. And, uh, you know, you've heard me, you know, yesterday going off on a small little rant about, uh, about data and about privacy and, mm. And the reason why I, I go off on this rant is because as an experienced designer, uh, I, f I really ask myself that question is, since when has it become a good user experience mm. to not be the owner of your data and of your privacy? Because mm. apparently today, this is the status quo and we all accept it. Mm. And we're being uh, kind of almost like hypnotized by Disney-esque type of experiences that are free, beautifully designed. Uh, they help us with short-term tasks and things that we do in life. Uh, but if you think of the longer-term experience, uh, they are a fundamental breach mm. on things that are very important in life. Mm. And that sets me off to think of you know, how um, all these products and services and these brands that, that are in this space, uh, without naming them, but we all know which brands they are, mm. um, they, they fundamentally design those experiences, and this is where it touches design. Mm. They design all of those experiences to completely persuade you and, uh, and convince you that there is nothing wrong with that. Mm. 
Now that to me is very scary design. <laughs> that yeah. is the most scary design in the world. Yeah. If you would do justice to design and really put people at the heart of your experience, mm. then, your ex then your user interface that, will, uh, that you will need to work with in order to approve the data uh, capturing, transparency of what happens with your data, mm. full control of your data uh, would be front and center mm. in the experience and in the, in, in the UI. Mm. And I'm sure that if they would do that, that of course a lot of people will not engage in those products and mm. services and they will demand um, either an ad adaptation of the services or they will just be very uh, um, selective about which data they would share or not. Mm. And right now I believe that we're being sort of, you know, like magic tricks, we're being uh, fooled into, uh, into something. And that, 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 that is, I find, worrisome. Mm. Um, why? Because um, I think we have, as individuals, mm. uh, so really as, as people, we are responsible for creating the future. Mm especially as individuals that work in this space, in the digital space, in, in the space of innovation, mm. where on a day-to-day -day basis, we're either part of agencies or part of big, big companies, and we make a lot of small decisions. And these small decisions, they will ultimately shape the future. Mm. And if as individuals, we don't take the responsibility and we don't act with a, uh, certain values towards the future, we will shape a future where our children will grow up, mm. uh, which, not might, which might not entirely be the future that we have envisioned. Mm. And therefore, I think that, uh, that always we need to be critical to ourselves, we need to be critical to the status quo, mm. and we need to uh, be part of the solution and be part of creating a future that we want to live in ourselves. Mm. Good. Thank you. Thank you for Thank coming you. to Rethink Dialogue. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Thank you.